you have a treat in store. Uh, Marcus Axel is going to talk to us today. Marcus uh, did his uh, PhD in Aachen, in physics, and uh, then he did a, a postdoc in... In Geneva, in Geneva at CERN. In CERN, correct. And then he's uh, spent the last 10 years at uh, Jurich uh, Research Center uh, working with uh, Carl Zillis and Katrin Amunds and uh, now leads the fi uh, fiber tractography group, uh, fiber mapping group, sorry, at uh, in Ulish. And he's uh, going to talk about uh, a wonderful uh, technology called polarized light imaging, 3D polarized light imaging, the structural connectome goes microscopic. Marcus. Thank you very much, Alan, for the nice introduction and for inviting me. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, let's go to, um, neuroanatomy and I would like to introduce you into a technology which we call 3D pol PLI or polarized light imaging and uh, I will tell you briefly what we can do with this technology and what we plan to do with this technology and our general mission is uh, as follows we would like to reveal the fiber architecture in postmortem brains based on whole brain processing, whole brain analysis, reconstruction at microscopic resolutions, which in the end means to us that we have to deal with terabyte to petabyte uh, of data sets. Let me start with a uh, wonderful example uh, given by, by Ellen and his group, uh, by Katrin and her group a couple of years ago, three years ago. It's, it's the big brain and it's the only uh, and the very first um, brain model which has been reconstructed completely from traditional histology, from traditional cytoarchitecture, based on seven and a half thousand single sections uh, measured at a few micron resolution. And they were able to come up with a complete 3D volume at a level of something like 20 micron. And this is, of, of course, something we would like to go to also with respect to the fiber architecture. However, you will see during the, the talk that we need some few other in ingredients than needed for this type of um, cytoarchitecture. In general, of course, um, the key elements are quite simple, right? You need to know the right technique to, to section the brain. Uh, you have to deal with the uh, imaging technology, how, however it looks like. Um, for polarized light imaging, we need a very specific type of image analysis. Um, and as you will see, this will be a, a very visual type of presentation. Visualization becomes more and more important, uh, especially for the high resolution data sets but it's also getting more and more challenging to visualize all these details we are able to reveal. Uh, the next step after single section analysis is 3D reconstruction, of course, and afterwards we, we can start the uh, 3D type of uh, fiber orientation analysis. So I will uh, go through this type of, of workflow in the next few minutes. So just to let you know what we do with the brain, we, um, we cut it and we destroy it. And uh, we have to do cryosectioning, which means um, we have to freeze the, the whole brain down to minus 80 degrees. Uh, it, is, it is put into a freezer and cut with a very large uh, microtome. And you see everything is done by hand and you introduce for each section very individual uh, deformations, cuts, whatever you can imagine. And this is really the main problem in reconstructing a whole human brain out of these deformed sections in the end. So uh, in, to give you so, some numbers, we section at 60 micron thickness. Um, the sections are not stained at all, so the technology utilizes uh, the so-called birefringence of the, of the tissue 
and uh, for this we don't need any any staining and we add up something like two and a half thousand three thousand sections per human brain we have to measure at one micron uh, level what we also do during the sectioning process is we take so-called block face images and you see here on the left hand side it's, it's just one of these images uh, you see here we, we have a barcode in the background. This barcode uh, allows us to very precisely reconstruct later on all the single block face images we have for each single section. And the result is uh, shown on the right side. Um, the uh, pixel or voxel sizes are in the order of 60 by 60 by 60 micron. And um, we use this type of, of data set as a, as a reference to later on reconstruct the deformed sections measured by polarized light imaging. So what is polarized light imaging and how did it all start? And we found one publication from Corbinius Brodmann, uh, early 1900. And uh, he wrote in one of his publications, it was in, in German, but I I translated it for you, of course. So I stumbled upon the idea of formalin fixed tissue much later and realized with satisfaction that formalin fixation does not impair the birefringence of myelinated nerve fibers. Therefore, we can study nerve fibers hardened and conserved in formalin with polarization microscopy. And this is exactly what we do in our 3D polarized light imaging. Why we call it 3D, uh, will become clearer uh, in the uh, contents of my talk. So we have set up in Jülich two different uh, types of microscopes. One is called uh, the large area polarimeter. Uh, and this guy is a one-shot imager, which means we can, we can image a large human brain section with one uh, imaging shot. This means we have a, a limited resolution of 64 micron pixel size um, and each file size is quite small so it's just 30 uh, megabyte. On the other hand we developed together with a small company close to Jülich uh, a, a real microscope which allows us to target 1.3 micron sized pixels uh, which means each large human brain section will be composed of about 100,000 by 100,000 uh, image pixels we have to deal with. And this also means we have 40 gigabyte of data per, per image, um, which means times 2,500 sections, we collect a lot of data just already in the, in the uh, imaging acquisition phase. So, the large area polarimeter looks like this. So we have a, a tilting specimen stage. We put the unstained section into the, uh, the setup and we rotate different optical filters around this setup. And if you have a look through this, this section, we start to see strong changes of intensity while rotating all these filters. And here's a movie how it how it looks like when we do the measurement on the left side you see the simple setup it is composed of two polarizers they have a very specific orientation um, with respect to each other we have a, a quarter wave retarder which is also rotatable and we have the the tissue uh, which is um, which is uh, lighted and lighted with a, an LED panel and we we take all these situations with a CCD camera. And you see on the right side, uh, especially in the, in the white matter regions, you, you see very, very strong effects. And this is due to the fact that uh, the myelin sheath of the, the axons is heavily birefringent. And uh, I have put two monitors on, on three different uh, three, three monitors on three different uh, uh, points within the tissue and you see underneath here 
the measurement. You see, it's in general, we, we measure some sinusoidal curve, but these curves, they, they are different in terms of amplitude and or phase. And this is exactly what we can use to infer different orientations of fiber tracts, of single fibers, depending on the size of the, um, the resolution. And uh, to give you an example, uh, when we measure one pixel, we see this sinusoidal curve here, down here. We do a fitting in the analysis, and the, the mean value of this sine curve is called transmittance, uh, which is shown on the top left side. The transmittance is quite similar to things like uh, myelin-stained images. It's just an image of the light extinction in the setup. Then we have the, um, the face of this, this curve, which is called direction. It looks like the image in the middle. And the amplitude defines uh, the strength of the, of the birefringence of the tissue. And it is shown on the top right. It's called retardation. And based on direction and retardation, we try to infer the three-dimensional orientation, local orientation of the fiber structures within each single pixel. Right. And you see, we, I've, I've already indicated that uh, we assign specific orientations, fiber orientations, to specific colors in our images. And that's the reason why the next images you will see look so very pretty and, and impressive. So this is an example of a result uh, showing the 3D orientation of the fibers on the left-hand side. You see uh, it's a visual system in a, in a vervet monkey brain. On the top right, you see a human brain, a complete human brain. Uh, the left one it has been taken with a, uh, with a microscope at 1.3 micron. And you see, you can, you can immediately see and contrast single fibers inside the, the cortex into different layers of the cortex. And with a uh, large area polarimeter, 64 micron, we can have a look at the whole brain to see what's the, the long distance connection between the different fibers. And in the end, and that's, that's very important, and this is different from most other uh, microscopic technologies, uh, with PLI we can infer contrasts without staining, and we can give these contrasts specific orientations. So you have more information within each thin section than we usually have with some any, any kind of staining. So this type of analysis, doing the fitting of the, the uh, different um, sinus, sinusoidal curves, um, is of course very compute intensive if you consider 2,000, 2,500 sections millions, billions of, um, um, of pixels. So uh, at some point we had to decide to utilize high performance computing, to utilize supercomputing environments. And fortunately we are very close directly next to us to the, to the Uli supercomputing center. So it was about uh, four or five years ago when we started to uh, think about how to organize uh, analysis workflows on the supercomputing. And everything currently starts at the lab, of course. We collect a lot of uh, information, metadata, uh, just from the lab settings. And we collect, collect a lot of, of images. And these are currently all um, organized and managed in uh, HDF5 file containers. So. Uh, this really helps us to, to keep the meta information and the imaging data together. Plus, it helps us to very quickly access the data because uh, parallel I.O. on, on uh, HDF5 files is uh, quite well established. So, based on this lab data, we can access from the supercomputing environment. In our case, it's a Eureka um, multi-purpose supercomputer in, in Jülich. Uh, we 
we acquire the data and uh, run the analysis section by section. Um, and this analysis includes this fitting of the data, it includes cleaning of the data. Um, for example, we, we apply um, independent component analysis to get rid of noise and dirt on the, um, on the measurements. Uh, we have to do some automated kind of uh, segmentation, so we are not interested in having some background in our data. Um, so, uh, and a at the end, when we do the highest resolution measurements, we measure them tile by tile, which are overlapping. We have to do a kind of stitching to end up with a whole human brain without any hole. Um, and uh, to give you an example, it's, it's, so it's, it's shown like this. In the end, we, we would like to come up with this colorful fiber orientation map. Um, just to give you one example from, from the workflow, it's a, a segmentation algorithm. We have uh, implemented a seeded region growing algorithm. You see on the top left there, that's, that's one tile of an image, uh, of a uh, PLI measurement. And uh, the green part above is the background and the tissue is uh, now highlighted in red. And uh, the, the algorithm tries to to understand which pixel, which image pixel belongs to which. And in this context, we, we tested different situations using just CPU-based supercomputing or using CPU and GPU um, input. And you can, we, we saw that we can easily um, get to a factor of 20 faster performance just using the GPUs for metrics, uh, for the metrics analysis. Of this, um, of this region growing algorithm. So when we do all this, um, in, in general, it's, it's not only interesting to have a look at the human brain. I mean, this is always the main goal, but usually you start with smaller brains, as everybody does. And for us, it's, of course, the rat or the mouse brain. It's shown on, on the left. Uh, it is the monkey brain, which is the next level of, of size and complexity for us, and of course uh, the human brain. And all these brains, they all exhibit this kind of birefringence. And that's, that's pretty nice. So let, let me show you um, how a highest possible resolution human brain section looks like. Uh, it's, it's a visualization used by MicroDraw. It's, a, it's an open uh, source uh, project here from, from the Pasteur University, in, uh, from, from the Pasteur lab in, um, in Paris. And you see the incredible complexity of a single human brain section. Right? The different colors, again, mean different orientations. When I switch, uh, the gray valued images, these are all the different modalities we can also extract, right? And this is what you have to deal with if you want to reconstruct the connectome at the level of a few micron or even better. So this is an example of the, of the uh, hippocampus if you want to, to address this. And you see all these single information you can get with polarized light imaging. You see, even see in the, in the uh, preliminary image, there were some, some dark dots in the measurement. This is, can be seen in this transmittance maps, in this light extinction maps, and they show um, uh, fiber bot, um, um, cell bodies. So we can, in principle, infer both fiber bodies, um, cell bodies and, and nerve fibers with polarized light imaging without any kind of staining. So all this already takes a lot of computation time, but the next step is even worse, right? So we want to rebuild the, the brain again, and um, that means we have to take all these sections, we have to uh, find corrections, nonlinear corrections, for the different uh, sections. And there are many approaches on, on the market. Uh, 
One has been very nicely demonstrated on the, on the uh, big brain and is even improved. And I just want to show you yet another one, but this is not a, um, an approach you can just put onto your, um, apply onto your um, measured images. You already have to have a quite good agreement between the adjacent sections when you want to address, uh, apply this technique. And this technique, uh, it's, a, it's a global approach. And this global approach includes, um, includes these block face images, right? You've seen quite at the beginning of the presentation. And we have the PLI measurements. And these PLI measurements are optimized to their correspondent uh, block face images but they are also optimized in the local neighborhood. And we do this procedure for all sections at the same time on the complete supercomputer. So that we have a global simultaneous um, kind of optimization process. The deformation model we use is a B-spline model and you can see here in, in this movie what you can in principle do on single sections. And it's immediately clear we have to be careful how to, where to move which pixel because we have to recover the, the anatomy. It's not that we just want to have a nice brain volume. It should be as realistic as possible. So that's always an issue. And it's always important to have uh, a neuroanatomist who are able to tell us if uh, the reconstruction is more or less realistic from whatever knowledge uh, it can be uh, said. But you, you see what, what you can really do. And the optimization process tries to optimize this single section to the correspondence, uh, corresponding uh, block face image. The, uh, the optimizer has been realized here by means of a Markov random field approach because the optimization process has in principle so many uh, free parameters that it is not um, computational if, you do, if, if we would um, uh, do it by a, a, a simple one-to-one um, um, -one optimizing process. Um, here are some, some um, speed up curves. We, of course, we have to go to the supercomputer um, and, and we try different types of, of GPUs to, to solve the problem. And with nowadays GPUs, we are able to reconstruct 180 sections uh, within 18 minutes. Just do one optimization run, which is fantastic. And usually you have to, to do many, many iterations on the, on the reconstructions to come up with a um, proper result. So what do we gain after all these processing reconstruction? Here's an example of the red brain. So that's a coronal section, the fiber orientation map. Uh, as I told you, visualization becomes more and more important for us. We, we realize that um, there are so many information inside a single section already that it makes sense to think about um, reducing this information to the observer. And this kind of, we call it spotlight imaging, is quite interesting. So you can go to the, to the data and you can manipulate by hand uh, the, the lookup, uh, the, the, color, the color code, and so you can um, project out your orientations you would like to see. Right, so it's a kind of, of, of virtual tractography. So this is the first 3D volume reconstructed at the level of uh, 60 micron voxel sizes. And this is a virtual sectioning through the uh, reconstruction. And you can see we can already quite nicely reconstruct, for example, the corpus callosum uh, at a quite precise level. However, you still see misalignments. So um, dealing with this post-mortem reconstruction means continuously improving the accuracy of the setup. But at least it's the first 
time that we could make a kind of um, proof of principle to show that it is feasible to reconstruct uh, the fibers. And the next step, of course, is as usual, you, you always need a reference space um, to provide the data, to share the data. And for the, for the rodent brain, it's, it's clearly the Vaxholm space. Um, and this is a project in the, in the framework of the Human Brain Project. Um, we, we are doing together with um, uh, Oslo University and Jan Bjorli's group. And uh, we managed to bring this uh, PLI data set into the Vaxholm space and applying in the next step uh, uh, some anatomical uh, uh, segmentations to the data sets. It's shown, shown like this. So this is also a way of, re of uh, reducing the immense number of uh, information you get. And this is the reconstructed red uh, corpus callosum based on the segmentation in the Vaxholm space. If you're interested in this type of, um, of um, work, you should meet uh, my colleague Nicole Schubert tomorrow at the, at the poster. Um, yeah, next size, vervet monkey brain. It looks like this, right? You can identify many, many uh, anatomical structures. And we were able to reconstruct a couple of weeks ago for the first time uh, 60 sections at 1.3 micron resolution, and you, you see it here. It's, uh, it's a cutout in the basal ganglia uh, region, and you can nicely see this is the reconstruction just of the, of the amplitude of the birefringent signal. So there's no orientation in it, there's no tractography done, and you can al already see that, uh, that you can identify in some regions where the fibers are not too dense, single fiber or small fiber tracts. So clearly the last step is the human brain. For this, we, we did the first measurements on uh, 180 coronal sections uh, and we reconstructed them. And what you can see in the next movie is uh, in the back, you see the retardation image, which means the amplitude image of our PLI measurement. And here you can see the extracted orientation vectors, also color coded. And you see the next cons 10 consecutive orientation vectors in depth so that you can see how the orientation changes in depth. Right? And we start with, let's say, MRI resolutions uh, at one, one millimeter. Uh, and so we are, we are going to one, one region. We increase the resolution because we do have the resolution to do that. And now we move in, into depth, right? And you, you can nicely see how the extracted orientations, they agree with the anatomical basis. But keep in mind, these, these orientation vectors, they are in 3D. It's just like a projection now in, within the, the image. And now you see the combination of the two measurements of the high resolution microscope and the lower resolution large area polarimeter. So we can go into the same section, do a much higher um, measurement. And now you see within the sagittal stratum um, crossing fibers. It's usually it's a, it's a field with fibers coming out of the coronal section. But here you, you can still see crossing fibers within this region. So in principle, with polarized light imaging, we can really address this kind of the idea of Google, Google Brain um, in future. So high resolution is nice, but how to integrate these data into well-known um, uh, technologies such as diffusion MRI, which is much, much coarser, and which needs, in some cases, especially for tractography, uh, some guidance. And uh, we thought about this, this problem also. And quite recently, we, we came up with an idea that we can uh, have a look into our high resolution data. This is a, a cutout here. You see a patch of 
fibers running in different directions, they are crossing. Um, and what we can do is we can make statistics on uh, single regions of interest. Statistics means we uh, create uh, orientation uh, vector histograms on a sphere with the contents of the different orientations measured within, for example, this, this uh, region here. And afterwards, we fit this distribution with um, a spherical harmonics. And so we end up with a very MRI-like, diffusion MRI-like data set. And this will help us in the end to, to rescale, to find similar features in the different uh, modalities. So coming to the end, um, it looks like as if we can uh, fill a gap which is present between the MRI world and the really ultra high resolution world of small samples here with, with our PLI technology. And in far future, of course, uh, we, will, we will add more modalities. Receptor architecture is quite interesting. We would like to combine cytoarchitecture, fiber architecture with receptor architecture into, uh, let's say, multi-model, multi-scale brain models of different species. And with that, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you to all my, my colleagues uh, and my team in special. Thank you very much for listening. You're in the football thing now. Yes. <laughs> that was fascinating and, and so entertaining, Marcus. So questions for Marcus, please. So is that giving you a way of seeing how much you lose uh, when you were doing diffusion imaging? Uh, and is that like, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways of using that as validation of, uh, or, or non-validation of the uh, diffusion imaging, given, given the recent papers on like with the tracers and the, in the, in the macaque and the... Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, I think, we, we get an idea what we lose, if you would like to call it, but it's, it's even more interesting to see the other way around. When you measure in diffusion MRI uh, some, some kind of, um, of spheric distribution of fibers, this might help us to understand why it is the case and uh, uh, why this is the case in the very specific region you are looking at. So it's, it's, like, it's really like a, a guidance and maybe understanding a bit more on the deep microstructure of the fibers. So you, <clears throat> you look as though uh, you need a major increase in computing uh, power. So is exascale, this is another major use of exascale computing, I'm guessing. Yeah. Because you're simply not going to be able to do a whole human brain anytime soon, given current computing technology? Um, for the reconstruction, it would be already possible to use the, uh, the current setups. Uh, currently, it's more a limitation in measurement uh, um, time. But of course, if you, if you, in the end, if you want to do a tractography on the high resolution data, uh, that's that's the next that's the next step, and for this you certainly need the next uh, exascale generation of supercomputers. Marcus, uh, when we did the big brain, we had uh, tremendous problems of uh, 2D slice to slice registration, and the question has often come up: well, Could we do uh, vessel tracking from from slice to slice? And the issue is always those very very high resolution jaggies are very hard to get rid of unless you have massive uh, local nonlinear warping. Do you have the same issues in PLI with uh, fiber tracking it's from slice to slice? Yes, yes. It's, it's, if you want to do fiber tractography at the, at the microscopic level, um, we are still not precise enough for doing this, this registration. And, uh, so maybe not at one micron, but could you back off to uh, uh, 
20 microns. Yes, I think that is that is that is possible. At this level, um, in, in specific regions or volumes of interest, it might be possible soon, yes. I'm convinced of this. And you can, you can even use um, vessels from, from PLI measurements. You very nicely see them in, the, uh, in, in these images. So you can use them also as features. Thank you very much, Mark. It's fascinating.